Welcome to ML Ops Live, a podcast by Neptune AI. We host in-depth discussions where machine learning practitioners answer questions from other practitioners about one subject related to production machine learning and ML Ops. Tune in to get real-life stories, dirty hacks, and pragmatic workarounds from ML people in the trenches. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to MLOps Live. I'm Sabine, your host, joined by my co-host, Stephen. Hello, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Sabine. Hey, and with us today, we have Vishnu Rachakonda, and our topic will be setting up MLOps at a healthcare startup. Welcome, Vishnu. Hey, how's it going? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. So Vishnu, you are a data scientist at First Hand, which is a mental health platform that helps individuals who struggle with serious mental illness engage with the healthcare system. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I just switched mics. That should be a lot better. Man, doing this at a coffee shop is, is not as easy and as charming as I thought it would be, but that's okay. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, that's correct. Uh, what you said there was, was exactly right, Sabine. I'm a data scientist, joined as the first data hire at First Hand. And what we basically do is help people who are experiencing serious mental illness. So one of one or multiple of bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, major depression, get into recovery through a peer-based recovery model that really provides them with a wraparound team of professionals to say, we're here to do whatever we can to help you get better. And we focus on people in Medicaid programs, which is sort of a low-income government uh, insurance program. Uh, so really some of the most downtrodden people in our society are really trying to help uplift them. Sounds like a pretty impactful service all in all. So good that's on the, you. That's the idea. Yeah. And you have a background in engineering, bioengineering, biomedical engineering, as well as previous experience in machine learning, being a machine learning engineer at Tesseract Health. So it seems like health and and engineering machine learning are all kind of a bit of a theme for you yeah no question i would definitely say that the arc of my career is focused on how we can use data to make people healthier and a lot of my education my experiences and even some of my free time is spent thinking about that talking about that uh, i think that there is a tremendous volume of healthcare data being created across the globe in existing healthcare delivery systems new healthcare delivery systems and we tend not to harness the power of that data in the same way that data is harnessed in other sectors of our economy and society. And closing that gap is sort of a big theme of my career and, and what I hope my next 40 years to be about. Right. So it's really like a proper mission, I guess. You could say that. You could say that. Yeah. And I'm sure that our listeners, many of them are not hearing you for the first time. You're very involved with the MLOps community as well, where your operations lead at the moment. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely say that I'm very involved in the MLOps community. I've, I've been involved for about two years now, uh, two and a half years, actually. You know, I can tell the whole story, but in May 2020, when it was 500 people, I ended up joining, meeting Dimitrios, who's the, the head organizer there. Now it's 12,000 people. Crazy to think that it's so big and so active, but it's been a big part of my journey. Uh, in learning about MLOps, ML infrastructure, and bringing that into my job. Awesome. And we'll be delving into a bunch of questions very shortly. Before that, I just want to take a moment to remind our audience that this is a live interactive Q&A. So our guest is happy to answer your questions. That's why we're here. All you need to do is raise your hand. Uh, use the function, raise your hand here in Zoom. If you want to speak up, you can also type in chat. That's totally fine. And if you want to send your question anonymously, you can send a direct message. And once we're done with the recording, we're going to release this as a podcast episode, uh, as always, a little later on. So wherever you get your podcast normally. All right. So Vishnu, to warm you up a little bit in, in one minute, how would you explain the value that ML solutions can bring to healthcare focused companies? I'm timing you. Oh, wow. You're timing me. Okay. Uh, starting <laughs> Actually, now. Uh, a <laughs> lot ahead. of healthcare delivery is about documentation and ensuring we have the right data to make the right decisions. And a lot of healthcare professionals have a lot of burdens associated with creating that data. What machine learning can help us do is unlock the value of that data in a way that makes people healthier and makes healthcare professionals more empowered to touch more lives. If they're not spending as much time documenting an electronic health record and manually creating a lot of this information and they're instead using that to make the right decisions for right people based on their context, we have a society in a world where people get healthier better. 
faster, right? And I think that is what machine learning can help unlock, right? It's helping turn that data into real value. How did I do? <laughs> exactly. That was even like less than one minute. So very ah, succinct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and as you said, yeah, like having a bunch of data is great, but it's always about how we can really like squeeze the most possible value out of it. And this is certainly an area where there's lots of potential value. So sounds really, really intriguing. Yeah. All I right. Think what I might add there just very quickly, you know, I'm not sure if the listeners are particularly familiar with our with our healthcare system, particularly the American healthcare system works, but there is a tremendous burden in documentation and in understanding what actually happens in the context of delivery that we then turn into raw data that is never effectively processed and used. And I think new techniques in machine learning, semi-supervised learning, uh, you know, one-shot learning, all these things can start to take that data, those petabytes of data literally that are being generated and turn that into like treatments, therapeutics, cures, care models that help make people healthier. And I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that in as much detail as possible. Awesome. And Stephen will take us into the more MLOPSY questions next. All right. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank you, Vishnu. And uh, I think we're going to be talking a lot more about the models, all the techniques pretty much later in the in the talks, because there are a few questions from the community on, the, on that one. But to set the tone of this episode, just want you to give us an overview of what it takes to set up MLOps at a healthcare startup. Yeah, great question. I don't know that I have the answer, but I have some version and some lessons I've picked up, you know, by virtue of doing this at a couple places. I think if I had to produce it to a three-step playbook, right, it's find a compelling use case, set up good process, and then leverage automation. Right. And I think that's sort of my three step playbook. And there's a little bit in that that's particular to healthcare, but there's also a lot that's not. And through being in the MLOps community, I've learned that components of that are abstractable to the financial industry, to energy, uh, to many other. But just to walk through that a little bit more, when I say find a use case, what we have to do as practitioners is not just build models that return good statistics, it's develop really products in a sense, right? products, whether it's our data or whether it's our models that deliver compelling value to end users who then want to then make those systems better. And so finding a compelling use case is, is the first step that I would suggest. And in the healthcare context, I think a great idea is to focus on, well, what's a healthcare professional that you can make incrementally more efficient? right? What is someone who you can allow to manage a panel size a little bit better? That's always a great starting point in a healthcare startup because healthcare companies are frequently challenged by panel sizes and how many people a professional can treat. And so that's the first step. And the second step is setting up good process, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, when we have a machine learning problem, there is a traditional data science and machine learning model development and monitoring process that we can follow, right? You should explore your data. You should build a simple version of the model. You should then iterate on that model. You should deploy that model initially and in deploying it, try to find try to set up some kind of rudimentary monitoring method, right? And this process can be as short or as sophisticated as you need, depending on your instance, but laying it out and showing how it connects to, you know, your end users is really important. So that's the second step is putting in place that process. And the third step here is really leveraging automation after you have a good idea of the process. I personally have made the mistake of trying to scale systems without necessarily understanding the elements in that system well, right? And I think that's why I put that automation step third in terms of saying like, okay, once you know your process, once you know exactly what you want to do, how can you automate it? How can you make it faster? How can you make it better, more scalable and more reliable so that more people can take advantage of your solution? That was a long answer, but you asked a big question. So I had to do that. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's really useful for uh, setting the tone for of the podcast. And I think in that vein, a lot of things we are going to be discussing are really going to be in terms of like the use case process as well as uh, the culture or whatever automation in some sense. And also to probably give us, maybe use a first hand as an example to walk us through thinking about the use case and the processes and then towards automation. What you're asking is a sample use case of machine learning or an example where that end-to-end -end process, those three steps that I laid out are applied. The ladder. The ladder. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I, instead of using firsthand, actually, I will uh, use an example from my previous role at Tesseract. 
And I'll talk about these things at a high level. I don't want to get too much into the detail because there's a lot of degree uh, and some IP, obviously, Definitely. that I can't talk too much about. But if we follow that, those three steps I out, like laid out. First, find a use case. I was working at a medical imaging company. Tesseract is a medical imaging company. And what we needed to do in terms of finding a use case was find a problem where medical practitioners are struggling with image interpretation, right? That's what we focused on. And we focused on fundus images, which are basically images of the back of the eye of the retina, two dimensional images that are traditionally in color and saying, okay, how do we help interpreters determine whether an image is bad or not, right? That's the sort of use case. And it's something that takes up a lot of time because if you have a lot of bad images coming through, or you have a lot of bad images coming through to ultimate like downstream physicians, they tend to get frustrated with the system and the imaging system, right? So that's the use case. The second step in terms of figuring out what the actual end-to-end -end process was is, well, first, if we're talking about, well, what is a bad image and what is a good image? We had to go through a data science process in terms of understanding from a Fund, sort of like a basic computer vision standpoint and a sort of more advanced deep learning standpoint, like what are the characteristics and features of a bad image versus a good image, right? And then we took those and we developed an initial modeling approach. We took that modeling approach and what we did was we did a combination of sharing the summary statistics for that model along with a lot of various class specific instances with the medical professionals that we were working with to, to get early feedback. And then what we did was deploy that model using an AWS Lambda and a monitoring software so that we could understand, you know, how that model was performing as our device was capturing more images, right? And then from there, we did the third step, which is leveraging automation, right? So we used Comet ML as a model registry, an experiment tracking platform, and then in terms of we used sort of AWS infrastructure as code approaches to be able to like spin up and modify that Lambda a lot more effectively going forward. And so that was sort of an example where we went through that entire three step process in the context of a healthcare use case. That's awesome. And thank you for sort of uh, sharing that use case to give us a really good perspective itself. And I think when we talk about setting up MLOps, right? A lot of things, a lot of people will sort of think about sort of the scale. Now scale in terms of like, you know, not just technology, but also the team, but also people and stuff like that. Maybe you can give us insight into what that team looks like at first hand that really enables MLOps itself. And, you know, yeah. I will be transparent and say that what we're doing at first hand is not tremendous machine learning at scale. What we focus on are really fun, much more fundamental analytics engineering and data engineering work that allows us to then deliver intelligent solutions to end users. And that is the key part that I want to focus on. I think a lot of times, even what happened for me early on in my MLOps journey was thinking that to deliver on the use case, I needed to develop a fancy model and that I needed a lot of expensive, both in time and cost infrastructure to be able to deliver that infrastructure, to de deliver that model, right? And, and keep it in maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of machine learning engineering is just hard because the tools aren't perfect yet. But I think in contrast, what I've tried to do with firsthand and what our team has tried to do uh, is really focus on how can we structure data effectively to deliver intelligent solutions to end users and iterate. And that to me is really core to the MLOps mindset, right? It's not just a combination. It's not just about like maintaining a lot of infrastructure. It's about how do you iterate? How do you go through the life cycle of an ML, ML product as quickly as possible and as scalably as possible? Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, they high level did. I mean, also got for more details on maybe like you have like a health, certain healthcare professionals, you sort of consult as domain experts and then you have data scientists on one hand and then maybe an infrastructure team. Yeah, yeah. So I think just to talk a little bit more about our context, right? We have integrated care teams of social workers, nurse practitioners, and certified peer recovery specialists, as well as a centralized team of medical doctors. And those are clinical end users. And from a data team standpoint, we have two data scientists and a data engineer. And the three of us combined to sort of work in a pretty full stack fashion, you know, having come from a machine learning engineering background, I'm comfortable moving up and down the stack. And that's actually one of the things I most enjoy and that I suggest to a lot of machine learning professionals is like, learn how to build the model and then go up a layer, right? In terms of like, well, how does that, you know, how does that interface with the data warehouse and how does the warehouse turn into visualizations, right? So that's sort of our philosophy is having like full stack data professionals. And I think what we try to do in doing that iteration to deliver value that I mentioned 
is we try to work with our clinical partners very closely. Uh, we don't really actually have a data PM yet. Our data professionals directly interact with a lot of our care teams and a lot of the sort of like business stakeholders, uh, try to scope out that use case and then say, okay, where in our data stack can we make changes? Is that at the warehouse layer? Is that at the data model layer? Is that at the DBT analytics engineering layer? Or is that at the Python sort of modeling code layer that allows us to test an approach that solves our end users problem? And so that is the way that our team literally approaches the mindset that I was mentioning earlier. That's really interesting uh, from that perspective. And I, I wanted us, just before we go into the community questions, by the way, I wanted us to just jump a bit more into the processes, like a uh, high level perspective, right? You know, you get a new project. What's your workflow like? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that there's a combination of like project management and technical processes that we could like spend time on both with. I think from a project management standpoint, I think that there's a lot of discussions about like, do you use agile and data, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we do try to take like a pretty spin based approach where we partner with business stakeholders to develop tickets take those tickets and use those to like literally measure velocity. We're very focused on velocity and trying to push as much code as possible as sort of technical stakeholders ourselves. So that's sort of the project management component. From a technical process component, I think that if I were to receive a new request from a user, the first thing that I try to understand is where in the stack do I want to confront this, right? As a full stack data professional, I have multiple tools that I can deploy to solve a problem at different points. And is it that I want to deploy my like basic ad hoc SQL? Is it that I want to deploy templated code in DBT? Or is it that I want to think a little bit more on the data modeling side, right? Like where along the stack do I want to solve this problem? Because where I solve it influences how quickly I can solve it, right? Making a fundamental shift in our data model is a little bit more challenging than just saying, here's a SQL query to write, or here's a, the ad hoc Python code to write. Uh, so that's the first step I take, which helps with sizing. And then it's just trying to develop a proof of concept or like a one week sort of sample that delivers value to a user, getting feedback as quickly as possible, and then iterating from there. We tend to work in one week sprints, which is really good because at the end of the day, as a technical contributor at a fast moving startup, three days of technical work and then getting feedback is probably a good cadence to be shipping on. Any slower and you risk missing value, any faster and it's like, well, you might not be doing the most thoughtful work. Right, uh, thanks for sharing If I may, that. before we continue, I wanted to circle back a little bit to this team question. If I understand correctly, you have a pretty, pretty small ML team right now at the company and you mentioned that you have this full stack philosophy. So is that something that you would you think you would retain? Like you see it as a bit of a principle, even if you scaled up the team or would you start kind of thinking that it's okay to have a bit more specialized expertise if the team scaled or would you still like to retain a core of kind of full stack ML ops team members? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a great question. I very much enjoy working with full stack professionals and having that be a part of what we do. And that is because in our industry and in our problem area, the context matters a lot more than the particular technical solution or the technical depth of the solution, right? At the end of the day, simple machine learning and simple data modeling changes can drive tremendous value in healthcare, right? And that doesn't mean that the work is any less difficult or any less impactful, right? It just means that our approach has to be different. But I think that if I were to move into an industry, let's say like e-commerce or transportation, where the volume of data is much greater and the work to be done is on some level, an order of magnitude more difficult technically, I might hire more for specialization. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. I hope that that's a good answer. Yeah, of course. Just wanted to clarify a little bit. It's probably going to be very dependent on the specific uh, setup, the specific domain, and yeah, the size of the team. So it makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. I think the last comment that I just make there is that like, as part of being an MLOps community, being on the podcast, you know, we've talked to companies like DoorDash, Uber, Stitch Fix, and a number of the sort of leading lights in the industry. And I think that what you start to find is that the problem space is what ultimately guides you to a philosophy. And I think that's the same thing that we try to apply. Right. Uh, thanks for that. And I'll just go back to a point you made about the iteration process and right, you're trying to walk in sprints, right? I think our previous episode, we did something on like the ideas of DevOps and the DevOps side that we try to apply to MLOps. If you haven't checked that out, listeners, you could just go check that out after the, this episode, of course. So 
I just wanted to know from your perspective as well, and you know, just the way you work as well, what are those ideas from the DevOps side that you also apply to setting up MLOps at your healthcare startup or any healthcare startup you work? Just so I understand, you're asking what core ideas from the DevOps world that we try Pretty to cross apply? Yeah. Yes, definitely. I mean, I think a big part of the modern DevOps movement is not necessarily reinventing the wheel in terms of infrastructure and focusing on being as close to value delivery as possible and using a lot of modern approaches to maintaining infrastructure and continuous delivery, right? So like something like infrastructure as code. I think where what we have done from trying to take that DevOps mindset and apply it to our industry and our team is two things, right? It's one, don't solve problems that somebody has solved better. Networking, servers, all these things that AWS offers services for, we're happy to pay. We're happy to pay. We don't want to necessarily be doing the most work in terms of solving a problem that a managed service can solve. So that's one. And then the second thing is really leveraging pipelining and workflow automation tools. I think this is a huge contribution of DevOps is to say that the work of an engineer 10 years ago, particularly on the data side, was to do a lot of things in sequence really reliably by themselves. And like kudos to the heroes at Facebook in 2012 who were like running scripts like just by hand and like making sure that the website had great uptime and, and wasn't falling apart. But that's not something I can do well. And that's something where tools like orchestration tools and, and pipeline tools like DBT uh, and Airflow and, 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 and uh, Dagster and Astronomer help so much, right? And that's what we want to start. That's what we focus on adopting are tools like that that help us stitch together the work to be done and execute it with like good reliability. We want to make those kinds of investments. Right, right. Thanks for sharing that. And we'll just jump right into some of the really interesting questions from the community on this particular topic that were pre-submitted. The first question this person asked, if you're, how are you leveraging generative AI in healthcare? Is there any take on that? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, interesting question. We are not, to be clear. We're not quite there yet. I think where I'll generally say is we are at a point in healthcare where a lot of data is not free-flowing enough and available enough that cutting-edge techniques like generative AI have been able to experiment with that and have a good level of reliability, right? Like there aren't medical notes floating around on the internet that you can just apply generative AI to. And so as an industry, we are five years behind where something where something like, let's say, B2B sales or like e-commerce or some of these other industries that are thinking about leveraging tools like that. So maybe ask me in five years and I'll have a great answer. Right. Yeah. Thanks. And in the same vein, the next question actually goes and said, this person asked, is it easy to leverage off the shelf models from platforms like Hugging Face without significant repercussions in the healthcare space? Great question. Easy is relative. I think that there are companies like Science.io, which is a sort of like medical text extraction company, modeling company that are trying to apply the latest in modeling large language models and sort of like other sort of like large model approaches to healthcare contexts. And they make it easier for us, right? Like rather than me going to Hugging Face and using some kind of NLP model on my clinical notes, let's say, there's a tool like Science.io that allows me to do that. And I think that there is a increasing number of healthcare specific vendors that are trying to take those tools and apply them to a healthcare context. As a healthcare company, do I want to be in the business of taking one of these like pre-trained models and putting it into the healthcare context? Probably not quite yet, because from an infrastructure, a data use standpoint, and from a end user standpoint, I need very stringent guarantees that I will not be in violation of any kind of ethical or regulatory requirements that these technologies have not yet matured to, right? In terms of those guarantees. Uh, That's not a comment on those technologies being valuable in someday, but they're just not there yet. And I think I'm hopeful that some of these like new managed services companies that you know provide this in a healthcare context will allow me as a user to be able to do that a lot more easily. All right. Awesome. So next question. Have you built AI systems in healthcare with key emphasis on responsible AI and ethics? What was your experience setting that up? Just integrating that into the your workflow. Yeah, I think that this was actually a question that I saw in the MLOps community Slack many moons ago. And I think that have I built machine learning systems that had an emphasis on ethics? Yes. 
has that been a part of a framework, a cohesive framework that maybe is akin to like the same way that the Hippocratic Oath works for doctors? No, right? And I think that as an industry, we still have a long way to go in terms of systematizing some of the ethical and responsible AI considerations that we talk a lot about, but right now are pretty difficult for practitioners to, to implement seamlessly. There's not necessarily an open source package, which I believe is actually the connective layer that you need in order to be able to make these systems like widely used and scalable. I think that there is good work going on. I think that for people who are interested in this, I would highly recommend checking out the latest edition of the Full Stack Deep Learning course. The last lecture by Charles Fry is actually on ethics, and there's a great section on healthcare, machine learning ethics in particular, that I've drawn inspiration from. But the short answer to that question is like not in a particularly well-engineered way, no. Yeah. And in terms of like the, what's it called, sort of like the ethics framework, let's say, because I know there's this company, Equity AI that really sort of developed this ethical framework for doing MLOps or ML at healthcare startup. How relevant do you think that that's sort of becoming, especially in the industry? I think that I am long bullish on these kinds of tools and frameworks. I just don't see them being used right now. And that may be, you know, part of my own myopia, right? Not being, I may not have seen them personally, but I think that they will be an important part of what we use, right? I would draw a parallel to a tool called CleanLab. CleanLab is a tool out of MIT started by a gentleman named Curtis Northcutt and a couple of his PhD colleagues. And what they do is using a simple open source package, help you find labeling errors in your data. Really magical tool. And someday, hopefully in the near future, there should be a near-term tool that allows you to do the same thing with the fairness and the responsibility of your AI system, right? An open source package that can allow you to do that. I'm not familiar with equity AI. I'm not familiar with any approach that allows you to do that as seamlessly as something like CleanLab. But I think three to five years from now, with the rate at which the conversation is advancing, the science is advancing, and the tools are advancing, that there could be something like this. Right. And just to add to that, and I wanted to just get the feedback on like just using more traditional, like responsible AI ML tools. Why don't they work sort of in the healthcare space? Or why do you think they won't work in the health space? Tools like Sharp, for example, for explainability and stuff like that. Why do you think they won't probably work in that setting? Yeah, I think that these tools are cumbersome and ultimately insufficient for our actual objective of responsibility and fairness. There has been work coming out that tools like GradCam, like visualization for computer vision explainability, like GradCam, are actually really not reliable in terms of explainability. You know, there was some great work out of uh, Stanford by a professor named uh, Pranav Rajprakar about that topic on how chest x-rays that use traditional computer vision explainability approaches are not actually being explained. It's really just a form of overfitting, you know, to put it very bluntly. I think similarly, like SHAP scores, there has been research that has been coming out that do these provide the necessary level of explainability that from an ethical standpoint, not from a technical standpoint, but from an ethical standpoint that we should be holding machine learning systems to? And the answer so far that I have seen is no, right? That's not to say that it won't get there. I also think that like things like SHAP score and Lime and stuff like that, like they're not the easiest to interpret. And that's a really, really important bridge to cross because I think that not every end user will be able to understand our arcane metric for explainability. There needs to be something that is really catchy in a sense, something that's very clear. And we're not quite there yet. And that just has to do with the fact that like we're sitting in 2022 and in 2012, deep learning was still new, right? A lot of these techniques are very, very new. I'm patient. I think we should all collectively be patient, but hold a high rigor in terms of like what techniques we ultimately end up productionizing. Great, great. Thanks for that answer. I think that satisfies my curiosity on that sense. And the next question, Fred asked, what are some of your guiding principles for doing ML at a healthcare startup? Touched on some, maybe you can give more details. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. If I had to really summarize two principles, it would be number one, like be really close to the end user, right? And then the second one, if I had to, you know, I just had it, I just had it and uh, <laughs> it's escaping me now. I'll come back to it, right? At a healthcare startup, you tend to have very sophisticated end users, actually. You know, you talk to medical professionals, you talk to nurse practitioners, you, you talk to whoever it might be in a medical context. These are not people unused to using sophisticated tools. The work they do is very sophisticated. And so they demand a sophisticated explanation for why machine learning systems work the way they do. It is not acceptable in a, as machine learning practitioners for us to say, 
oh, well, you know, this is the way the system works and this is how I see the world and I expect you to see the world the same way. You're dealing with very, very well-versed people, right? In a lot of challenging topics and you have to offer them that level of detail. You have to partner with them effectively. And I think that that is a big part of ultimately connecting the machine learning to real end user value. You can't come to a doctor and say, this is where in your workflow, this machine learning system will work because they won't use it. You have to allow them to say, this is the problem I want solved. And then you have to figure out ways of showing that you can incrementally solve that problem and iterate and deliver value, right? So I think that be close to the end user is, is one of my main guiding principles. And then the second thing, I got it now, is really focus on simplicity, right? I think that there's um, ignorant simplicity and there is enlightened simplicity. And in the middle is overbearing complexity. There's some quote like that, right? And as machine learning practitioners, we tend to be in the middle of that bell curve where we're focused a lot on the complexity in terms of saying like, oh my God, these are all the things that are happening in the data. These are all the modeling approaches that I could try. And like, this is how this like rather arcane system results in this very interesting result. When what we really want is enlightened simplicity because then everybody can participate, right? And I think that I have had the best results when I have been able to say like, hey, this is this is like really elegant, clean, simple solution that you get and I get and that we should all use. And I think that there is, not to belabor this, but there is an anxiety in technical professionals that if we are not doing complicated things, we are not applying our skill set or we are not doing our best work. And I would really push back on that and say like the simplest thing that you're doing, the simplest thing that drives the most value, that is high ROI, that is doing great work, right? That should be the definition of like doing your job well. And so my second principle is like embrace simplicity. Right, awesome. And I'm very interested in these principles and let's just zoom in into the first one, uh, which is like being close to end users. I think when, when your particular workflow, do you really involve like these healthcare professionals or maybe like key stakeholders a lot more? Do you just maybe during the like requirements gathering stretch, do you just work with them and just try to understand the project there and that's it? Or even after deployment, right, you still work with them to ensure that maybe results and stuff. Where do you pretty much involve them? Yeah. I like to do it right at the beginning. My secret tip is pair program with your end users. They love it. They'll make time for it. It allows them to understand your workflow and it allows them to see your data. It allows them to see where you struggle as well, right? Like there have been many pair programming sessions where my end users are like, wow, all you do is just Google code. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I do, <laughs> right? It's like trying to figure out what random pandas, you know, syntax allows me to do the thing you're asking me to do. And so I think that involving them upfront pair programming with your end users is, is great also because it makes you a better engineer. It also makes you a better coder to pair program live. You just get faster. So I think doing it from the beginning, involving them in the technical process as much as you can. And, you know, it's requirements, but it's also the actual implementation as well, that you can get a lot of great insights from sophisticated end users. So that's sort of my approach. Perfect, perfect. And this is sort of a, a question from the community that's been asked a few months back. And I thought it'd be interesting to have it on a, on a show. And it's sort of like, uh, what have you seen as healthcare specific challenges in MLOps or doing ML engineering today? Yeah, quite a lot of them. I know that you. you also yeah, really healthcare specific challenges. I think that in a healthcare context, I'd say that we don't have a lot of great examples out there. If I want to predict stock prices using time series data, <laughs> there are a million tutorials, there are a million examples online, there are a million towards data science posts, and there are all kinds of sophisticated explanations as well on archive or wherever else with code examples, with implementation, and with the results. In healthcare, we don't really have that. We don't really have that same open source culture. We don't really have that same sharing mindset that I think other industries have embraced and allowed practitioners to move much faster with. And I find that a lot of times my challenge is if I'm walking into a new use case, it's figuring out what previous use case that I can draw inspiration from and apply. So I would say that that's a general challenge that when you walk into healthcare, you experience. The second thing that I would say is complicated data. We tend to think about, for example, in image recognition, right? Images are reasonably straightforward forms of data right? Like you have a 3D matrix of like pixel values and like what you see is what you get. And healthcare data is not what you see is what you get. 
you, for example, insurance claims, healthcare insurance claims have a tremendous amount of nuance to them because they are both billing statements as well as statements of record about what an individual's health at that moment during that encounter actually was, right? And so both of those things are happening concurrently. The fields and what those fields mean, the interpretation is actually pretty complicated. And so you can't walk into a healthcare context and assume that just because your data is structured and appears reasonably free of obvious errors like missingness and sort of like null values, that it's good data. You have to understand the underlying logic in a way that other realms and other data formats don't challenge you. And I would say like, that's very specific. You have to understand the healthcare claim. You have to understand the clinical note, what actually leads to that. And I think that's what keeps it very intellectually interesting for me. Not to say that other realms aren't, but like, I really like the fact that I'm challenged to understand what the data means in healthcare. So I hope that that answers the question. Yeah, that touches on it a little bit. And just flipping the question a bit, what are some of these like ML challenges that you see that really plague doing healthcare at the startup? It's annotation. I've often right. thought that, and there's a simple question of like, how do you get data that's annotated? But there's a more sophisticated question of how do you annotate well? I think Google has done tremendous research here around like how to think about agreement between clinical professionals and how to use that as a barometer for like good annotation quality. I think that there are companies like Clean Lab that are providing tools for this. There are companies like Centaur Labs that are providing like annotations literally and Snorkel as an example of like another sort of like data tool. But when you set up a machine learning task and you need like labeled data, how to do that in a healthcare context is like really challenging because it's, it's just not easy to get the data and it's not easy to coach the professionals in terms of how to be good annotators and how to think about the consistency across the entire data set, which is what you need as a machine learning professional. What you'll find a lot of times, what I have found is when you ask people to annotate, they'll be really slow at annotating individual data points. When as a practitioner, I could care less about a single data point. It's the fact that I want the entire data set rapidly annotated with some level of consistency, right? That is a very different mindset than healthcare professionals who are trained to look very closely at each case and say, what is the best thing to do here, right? And so I think that there's a little bit of the mindset in the science and annotation that I view as like a crucial machine learning challenge. I think as more data sets get annotated, we will get better at this as more clinical use cases get annotated. But yeah, that's sort of what I would say the main machine learning challenges. Great. And uh, I think we'll not do this particular topic justice if we don't touch on the sort of the elephant in the room, right? Which is like uh, healthcare, we see issues with like regulation, right? You know, and when you deploy models and showing like governance on that side, but also data privacy problems as well, data privacy challenges. I'm just sort of thinking at a high level, you know, how do you solve these data privacy issues and regulatory concerns that sort of come with doing MLOps at a healthcare startup? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that what we need to be honest about is that regulatory burdens, privacy work in healthcare is not really tied to end user value. It's tied to compliance. And when you shift from that mindset, you start to realize that like what compliance is about is having a checklist and making sure that you're like really good about your process. And so that's the mindset that I try to approach, which is like, how do we make sure that the system is compliant with the latest and greatest and most rigorous standards and just being disciplined about that, right? I think IT professionals bring a tremendous amount of experience here where a lot of IT work has like a lot of checklist avoidance. Cybersecurity is very similar in this regard, where they're like very rigorous and detailed about their approaches to like avoiding problems. And that's the same mindset that machine learning practitioners need to bring to ensure that their healthcare solutions are ultimately like compliant, regulatory grade, and like respectful of users' rights, which is to be rigorous about what the steps are, put it in a checklist, and just make sure that you're disciplined about executing that checklist. Are there sort of checklists, are, are these checklists all specific to companies or, you know, their standards that maybe you want to share? Is that- I mean, I think that there are industry standards like HIPAA compliance. There's That is an accepted industry standard. You can find it in the text of the legislation and in a lot of other sources. Uh, SOC 2 is another certification that companies can achieve that is, is useful for people to understand. I do think, however, that each company has their own approach that depending on your context, your users, and on your sort of access perspective on who gets what and who's involved in developing what, that you kind of need to originate internally, and that needs to become an internal competency. So it's a combination of like finding state of the art 
and following it and also developing the right sized approach for your context. Great job. Thanks. Yeah, we do have a question in chat at this point. Onyeka is a bit curious, Vishnu, about the exact MLOps tools that you use for all parts of the MLOps process. So if you could shed a bit of light on that. Okay. Well, the exact MLOps tools, I like using Comet ML for experiment tracking. I like using Gantry for monitoring. I like SageMaker as an ML platform. I like AWS Lambda a lot. I like a lot of AWS services in general. It's my favorite cloud provider. I do like Google BigQuery a lot. I think that it is also a machine learning tool, especially with the way that they've been really trying to bake in machine learning into you know, the SQL console itself. Let's see, any other MLOps tools that I would recommend? I've tried DVC. It's not really stuck for me as part of my workflow. In terms of data set versioning and really making sure that my data is versioned, I haven't quite found a tool yet that's stuck. And in terms of annotation, I like Label Studio. It's an open source labeling tool. Uh, I also think Scale has some great options here. So yeah, is that helpful? Oh, I'm sure. Thank you very much. And uh, Onyeka also has a follow-up question. Speaking broadly, between NLP and CV, which field of deep learning offers greater opportunities of greater impact in healthcare, given the challenges? That's a great question. And there's not an easy answer. I would say that right now, NLP is particularly blossoming. There is a lot of text data that is freely generated in healthcare, but is not freely available. And with the advent of large language models, with the advent of text tooling for machine learning, NLP is very well positioned to be really impactful over the next two to three years in a lot of elements of healthcare workflows. So I definitely think NLP is great. I think long-term computer vision, it's a little bit different how I would frame it, right? I would say that NLP is more near-term positioned to help with healthcare workflow and process. Computer vision is positioned to help in the long term with diagnostic performance. That is a harder problem in the long run. It is a problem where there are more unknowns. Like how do you diagnose cancer well, right? How do you, from a pathology slide, like these are genuinely unknown questions where the biology is as much of an unknown as the technology. But I think that if that is your interest, computer vision is also really a space where because of the tooling, we are able to make you know, faster strides. So short answer, NLP now, CV long-term. Yeah. Thanks for breaking that down in a very clear way. And thanks, Onyeka, for the question. We do have another question by Priyanka, who is asking, do you recommend using some model monitoring tool as such? And if yes, how do you decide between build and buy? Yeah, great question. I do recommend using a model monitoring tool. I do recommend experimenting with tools and with trying out tools early on in your process of deployment to understand what you like. The question of model monitoring is really not a machine learning problem, but a product performance problem. When you put a model into production, you are making it a part of a product and some value for the end user. And when we talk about things like data drift and other sorts of problems that creep up as models get stale, It's really not, the problem isn't really that the model is getting stale. The problem is that the value for the end user starts to shift and become unpredictable. And so that is actually a product problem. And so when you think about monitoring, I would say first with like from a product standpoint, what is the metric we need to monitor? What is the performance that we need to guarantee? And then select a tool that ultimately allows you to do that most effectively. There will be different monitoring tools that allow you to, let's say, monitor image data as opposed to text data or in different industries like Fiddler may be somewhat better equipped in the banking industry as opposed to other industries, right? But start with the product problem, figure out the tool that allows you to meet that product performance in the industry that you're in. And I would say the last thing I'd say is like definitely check out Shreya Shankar's writing. She's a PhD candidate at uh, UC Berkeley, first ML engineer at Viaduct. She has written a ton about monitoring, tremendously useful stuff, probably the authority. Chip Huyen has also written on this topic. And start there, read read that stuff, and you'll be like very well positioned to like pick a monitoring approach. Some very good tips there. Thanks, Vishnu. And thanks, Priyanka, for the question. These are great questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. I'm just trying to, you know, sort of get back into our groove of like, you know, data assets, data privacy issues, and and stuff we're sort of discussing earlier. And I'd love to know, how do you sort of get different teams to work within the like data access, security, and sort of governance paradigms when doing MLOps? Because I think you're talking about production data coming in, and then there are people that you restrict that data, uh, restrict from working with such data. You know, how do you sort of work within that paradigm in terms of security and 
data privacy, especially in the healthcare place where it's really crucial? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with honestly IT and controls. As a machine learning professional in a regulated industry, I would encourage you to learn more about things like identity and access management, access controls and snowflake, things like that. Like they're not that hard, but those are the kinds of nuts and bolts that really allow you to make sure that you're doing things right. As an industry, we've come a long way through tools like Okta and Auth0 and stuff like that, that where we have much better tooling around like access, authorization, who should be seeing what in as seamless a way as possible. If you are interested in like being a high leverage developer in a regulated environment, learning these kinds of things are, is really, really helpful. Because to be honest, it's really not the most complicated area. It's just a detailed and rigorous area because what you're trying to do is avoid making mistakes. And that's where, again, we can learn a lot from information technology. We can learn a lot from cybersecurity. And I would just suggest like, take a look at how a tool like Snowflake allows you to you know, set up permissions, right? Take a look at how AWS allows you to do that. Take a look at how it allows you to do that in code, which is actually tremendously useful for developers. I think that those sorts of nuts and bolts are like the highest leverage way to add to your skill set and solve the problem. Yeah, thanks for that answer. And this is a question I think we should still ask earlier. Well, nevertheless, I think it's really important. And I'm sort of thinking, what are some of the very first components you put in place when setting up MLOps at uh, a healthcare startup? You know, you talked about really experimenting quick. You sort of think of like experiment tracking first off, and then you, as you graduate, you then try to include automation or what are those components you put out there first? I mean, I start with experiment tracking, just as sort of like a first step because it's local to my workflow, right? I mean, really, if I'm trying to like think about it, I mean, I would first set up a solid development environment, right? So like set up, you know, your requirements.txt, set up like your package management, all that stuff, right? Your development environment should be reproducible. Uh, and that's a first step, right? Your code should be reproducible. Set up, get all those things. Then your model should be reproducible, right? And that's where experiment tracking uh, and all those things sort of start to come in. And then I think the third thing is really around data, right? And making sure that your data is like, high quality and set up properly. As an industry, we should start to move away from things like, you know, just having your data saved as a local CSV and import it, right? We should be using more structured things like eh, set up a simple database, maybe use a data warehouse, like whatever it might be, right? Like try to use a higher fidelity data storage tool if possible. That's not possible for something like images, of course, but there are ways that you can make sure that your storage ultimately allows your data to have certain guarantees about uh, reproducibility, which is core. To MLOps. So that's sort of an area that I start. I think the other area that I'd start with is our sort of around culture. And that's where like there are essential readings that I think are really important. I think that Google Cloud has put out like a lot of the most helpful content on like what it actually takes to implement MLOps. I highly check out reading some of their white papers on like continuous delivery for machine learning. Martin Fowler has written an article literally called that, that I think is like required reading. Uh, I actually wrote a blog post called the top 10 reads that influenced my journey as a machine learning engineer. And that's like 10 essential articles that basically encapsulate my approach to setting up MLOps in any environment. So check that out. And that'll provide a lot of the resources for how I approach this. Right. And yeah, thanks for sharing that. And just, just a quick one before we sort of wrap up. I think we haven't really spoken about sort of in depth about adopting tools for doing MLOps, even especially our healthcare style. We talked about that in the responsible AI space. But generally, what are the dangers you sort of see with adopting tools or open source tools or maybe vendor based tools and uh, doing what MLOps at healthcare? I mean, I think what tends to happen with a lot of vendor adoption, and I've made this uh, mistake myself, is you, know, you have a problem, some local problem that you as a practitioner experience. You find a tool that allows you to solve it. For example, like I need to be able to run Python code in a DBT workflow. Oh, features and labels. That's a tool right now that allows me to do that. Okay, maybe I'll give it a shot. You set up some kind of like short proof of concept and you're like, great, this allows me to work and like solve the local problem. But you never actually think about in a more mature way, how does this then become part of my platform? How does this become part of my repeatable process for delivering machine learning value? And I think that's where I would encourage all buyers and decision makers around adopting like vendors or open source tools. Like, Don't just think about the first use case. At least have a perspective on how it can be repeatable and repeatably used by not just you, but the developer that comes after you. I think that if you start off with that thought, you actually have the persistence and the like long-term buy-in to adopt the vendor to its fullest ability because like 
no matter what a vendor says, it's never a two to three week thing. It's really a six to 12 month value journey that you're trying to prove the ROI for. And you should get into it with that mindset. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I thought I sort of get your opinion on that as well. And maybe ending on a happy note from my end, I just wanted to know what are some of your pattern practices that you think should be out there for setting up MLOps at a healthcare startup? Like, you know, people are not doing this a lot and then you just want to ensure that a lot of people are doing it more. Honestly, I think my opinion is that more machine learning practitioners should spend time doing data engineering and doing analytics engineering. Honestly, I think that I've really enjoyed it shifting from the sort of like, hey, I'm building a model to like, hey, I'm working at a more fundamental base layer of like how data is generated, structured, and then ultimately applied to a problem. I think that like it can seem a little boring at first, but once you start to dive deep into the data, you know, the solutions that open up, the opportunities that open up for like future use cases of machine learning are like really exciting. And I think that more machine learning practitioners would benefit from moving down a layer in the stack. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. All right. I believe it's time for us to wrap up. So Vishnu, thank you for coming on to share your expertise and give all those practical tips. You already mentioned uh, MLOps community where people can find you, but is there any other way maybe for people to find, follow what you're doing? I mean, click the follow button on LinkedIn maybe, or uh, send me a message. My website is vero-sr.com. That's like my little online pseudonym. I don't like writing under my name, <laughs> but uh, you can check me out <laughs> online, it. follow me there and uh, you know, shoot me an email, a LinkedIn message if there's anything in particular you want to connect on. Awesome. Lots of ways to connect. All right. Here at MLOps Live, we'll be back in two weeks. See you then. And in the meantime, see you on socials and in the MLOps community Slack. Thanks and take care. MLOps Live is brought to you by Neptune AI. Remember that you can join us live at the next event and ask your questions. And you can register at neptune.ai slash events. And then make sure to search for MLOps Live in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcast. Click follow and don't miss any episodes. Thanks and see you next time.